So this is a Yoko Omo YZ10. Um, this was my favorite RC car when I was about 12 years old. And it's made from the finest materials that you can imagine. It's made from Kevlar, from carbon fiber, magnesia. And it was really awesome. But one day, um, oops, uh, one day my dad wanted to join me on a drive in the forest nearby. And it failed after just a few minutes. And I could see that my dad was disappointed. Uh, so I was wondering how would a proper engineer actually solve such a problem? How, why don't they fail? And this made me go to the Internet Cafe back in 1997. Do you remember 1997, what it was like to go to the Internet Cafe? You know, um, you had 128 kilobits per second. And I needed fast internet because I wanted to see how the Pathfinder, which is actually just another fancy RC car, right, uh, find its way on the Martian surface. I wanted to see which pictures it takes and how it looks like on the moon. Uh, sorry, on the Mars. <laughs> we want to go to the moon. Um, the video quality that you, um, that you could see was awful. <laughs> I, I tried to recreate it on the slides here. So, yeah. But I was amazed to see how the NASA engineers were able to send a rover to Mars and send back video while I was disappointing my dad in a forest. Older generations uh, may have seen the Apollo missions, and as we just learned, there are not many of you here. But Pathfinder mission was my personal Apollo, and it inspired me to become an, an engineer, especially within the space industry. And many years later, just after my graduation as a Master of Science, I thought about what I wanted to do for a living. And I had a very nice job offer from IBM, but it would not change the world, and so I declined it. I wanted to do something with space. Maybe not in space, but maybe something on Earth. So I looked at positions that were open at the time, and most of them sounded rather boring. I didn't want to become a bureaucrat writing papers for missions that would never happen. I wanted to do something that people would talk and think about years after it happened, like a mission to the moon. I wanted to participate in a real adventure, and so I started my PhD because at least there I could change the life of a few students for better or worse. <laughs> um, then one day, at the end of, the, of 2009, a small group of nerds gave a presentation at a hacker conference that I attended, and it was titled, A Part-Time Scientist's Perspective of Getting to the Moon. And they presented the audacious plan to send a rover to the moon, drive at least 500 meters, and therewith win the Google and X Prize. And I thought, wow, this is really crazy. And um, so I joined them. Uh, <laughs> And like me, many other people did. And at peak times, we had almost 100 people working on this mission. The team was funded by Robert Böhme, the guy on the right-hand side, who heard from the Google and X Prize from a colleague. And he invited some of his uh, friends and brainiacs to a barbecue. And after a few good sausages and steaks, it was decided that this is not impossible, but it's just very difficult. Since then, we have created four iterations of our lunar rover, one that you can see on the side here and two iterations of a lander, and we are currently working on our final piece, masterpiece of Rover. And the team name is Part-Time Scientist and actually says it all. We spent the last six years working in all of our spare time, and uh, occasionally some of our working time, um, to get this mission done. We want to send a Rover to the moon, and we want to do so by the end of 2017, or before the first passenger plane takes off the new BER airport. This should give us plenty of time. <laughs> you may think that space exploration is only done by the brightest people uh, in white coats working in a lab at a high-profile space agency like NASA, but this is absolutely not true, except these guys. No one wears white coats, and everyone hates those goggles. And, uh, but the advancement of technology and the internet has made it possible that everyone can work on a space project these days. It doesn't even have to be expensive. Today, when you think about space exploration, you most likely think about missions like Fila E, which landed on a comet, or Curiosity and other big missions. They are the pinnacle of space exploration, absolutely. But they don't happen very often. And the moon landing is already four decades old. 
but the budget of space agencies is shrinking. And wouldn't it be nice to kickstart space exploration to get more science done more frequently? Let's look at two different missions um, that exist today and how they differ. The NASA Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution Mission, or short MAVEN, is a space probe designed to study the Martian atmosphere while orbiting Mars. Uh, it's, uh, the mission goal was to figure out whether, uh, how the atmosphere of the Mars and its water were lost over time, and it was successfully launched on the 18th November 2013, and it was at several uh, scientific, scientific and engineering experiments, and it was considered highly successful. The Mars Orbiter Mission, um, in short, MAM, also called Mangayan, is a space probe orbiting Mars, and it was launched on the 5th November 2013 by the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, just 15 days before MAVEN. It's the Indian's first interplanetary mission, and ISRO has become the fourth space agency to reach Mars. And what's interesting is that it's the first Asian nation to reach Mars orbit, and the first nation in the world to do so in its first attempt. It too featured very interesting scientific engineering experiment. So what differentiates those two missions, the one by NASA and the one by ISRO? Well, <laughs> the NASA mission cost $671 million, and 187 of which were for the launch vehicle alone. The Indian mission was flown for $72 million on a launch vehicle that cost just $20 million. Think about it. The Indian mission was just one-ninth of the price of the NASA mission. And of course, it's very difficult to assess how much more interesting data the MAVEN mission was able to collect, but I proclaim that sending nine smaller probes would have yielded more interesting data than simply sending one probe. You can go to more places and you can collect more diverse data. For example, if aliens landed on, the, on Earth and they landed in the Sahara Desert, they might come jump to the conclusion that the Earth is a rather boring place. But if they sent down nine probes, one of which landed in Area 51, and the other a hovered of the White House, um, they might have found Earth so much interesting, as several movies show. <laughs> but the question is, how could the Indians make a mission to the Mars with a price tag that was less than the launch for the NASA mission itself? And well, you might say the labor in India is cheaper, so that must be it. But it's not that easy. Materials are not that cheaper, and there's a simpler answer to that. But let me, I want to talk about something um, where I went to. This summer, just three months ago, I went to LA, and I went to three interesting places. The first one is Norton Sales, and it's a rocket parts surplus store. This is like a candy store for rocket scientists, <laughs> where you can buy all kinds of funky parts. And unfortunately, the owner is not able to get new parts because the sales of rocketry parts has been forbidden after 9-11. And so it's a treasure trove of Apollo and Gemini parts. And with all kinds of weird-looking parts, those are now used as movie props, which I think is really a shame. And it may, but it made me wonder, why are there no more manned missions to the moon? And there's a simple answer. But let me tell you about the other places I visited first. The second place I went, I went to was the California Science Center, where you can see an actual space shuttle. If you stand below one, you realize that those are really big. The space shuttle has always been the natural way for people of my generation, and probably yours as well, to go to space. It was hard for me to imagine that anything amazing would ever happen on a Soyuz rocket, on a, a Soyuz capsule in a Russian rocket. But why did the NASA stop actually flying the space shuttle? It was partly because some of them were failing, but it was also because it was very expensive. The space shuttle was supposed to be the cheap taxi um, to space, but it never became that. The third place I visited was SpaceX. In 2005, Elon Musk started SpaceX, and with the money of just one single space shuttle launch, he created an entirely new rocket that is now used to resupply the ISS. He aims to create a rocket that exceeds the payload capacity of a space shuttle, and with a price tag of just 90 million, which it is stated to launch in spring next year. To put this into perspective, a regular launch of the space shuttle costs about 450 million, or if you take the whole cost and divide it by the number of launches that happened, you arrive at a figure that's much higher. It's 1.5 billion per launch. The SpaceX Falcon 9 Heavy costs about 90 million, 
And if you take all the costs for development divided by the number of launches, you arrive at just 100 million. And there it is again. It's more than a factor of 10. And the question is, how was SpaceX able to get there uh, as they produce in the US with the same materials that NASA has available? They don't have the advantage of ISRO of producing in India with cheaper labor. So why couldn't the NASA do it? And uh, the answer is surprisingly simple. He started with this, a blank page. He adopted a fresh mindset and put in his own money. And as he put in his own money, he made sure that none of it gets wasted. The SpaceX discarded ancient wisdom from the space industry, like space certified toothpickers, and instead used regular off-the-shelf components. And he doesn't have to report to no one except himself because it's, because it's a privately owned company. And he's making rockets like he's building cars in the factory and its masses. Uh, and it's funny to say because he actually produces rockets and cars. And he's the only one. So he adopted an entrepreneurial mindset and took risks that NASA didn't take or couldn't take. And the Indians were able to cut the prices because they took risks too. They also had the political will to demonstrate what they are capable of. Just like Kennedy did when they launched the Apollo program. Instead of seeing another risk to fail, they saw an opportunity to demonstrate what they are capable of. And they also use new technology more, more aggressively. Those parts have become better and more reliable, uh, more reliable than most NASA or engineers are able or uh, dare to acknowledge. After all, computers these days are used to replace mechanical constructs in cars. And if they failed as frequently as they did decades ago, we would probably have died already. So I'm not blaming any of the NASA or ESA engineers for not being progressive enough because it's a politic that's at fault. Why was a decade-old mission to the moon possible? Because JFK had balls, and he had personality. There's no, no. He, accepted the, the, he accepted the risk that were associated with his missions, and he pulled them through. Uh, nowadays, you don't get rewarded for taking risks, even if that risk could yield new opportunities like uh, money saving and space exploration. In big organizations like NASA, it works this way. If you take a risk and you fail, you're fucked. <laughs> if you take a risk and you succeed, you will be rewarded by not being fucked. If you think about it, if you avoid risk, nothing positive will happen either way. This approach makes any organization risk averse, and in, which in turn inhibits the use or development of new technologies and there is makes you stuck in decade-old technologies, which in turn drives up the cost. What Elon did is private space. It lowers the cost of getting somewhere and provides commercial services to space agencies like NASA and ESA. With a rocket just one-tenth of, the, of, the, of a rocket that was built by a space agency, entirely new possibilities open up. Um, there could be new Earth-observing satellites, and internet can be brought to everyone. And more signs can be carried out. Eventually, we might even set foot on another planet. And this is an endeavor that's mostly possible with reduced cost. With the current cost, it's not possible. With reduced cost, we can run more experiments for the same uh, money, and we can let more people participate in them as well. And I want to give you a simple example of an experiment that creates new learning opportunities. The principle of this experiment is very simple. You watch a plant grow. We know how that looks like on Earth, and we also know how it looks like on the ISS. But what about the moon? We want to send uh, people onto other celestial bodies, but we need to find a way for them to grow their own food. And the experiments on the ISS show that this might not be as easy as we thought. This is why NASA engineers created um, an experiment called the Lana Pl the Lunar Plant Growth Experiment, and it's a simple greenhouse for plants to grow in. And the goal is to research how plants grow on the surface of the moon with its one-sixth gravity, its radiation, and all the other environmental factors that you have. But what is most interesting about this experiment is that NASA ever actually never plans to build it. Instead, they want, they want to hand out the blueprints so that students all over the world can create their own variation of the lunar plant cross experiment. And this could be sent along our mission to the moon, and interesting data would be collected. It covers the fundamental of lives and inspires students to think about life beyond Earth. 
When we started the part-time scientist, we worked, as our name suggests, part-time on our mission. We spent evening, nights, and even weekends, and occasionally some of our working time, to get this mission done. We are no one special. Everyone could join our team, and most of our team have actually never worked in the space industry. But we know who to consult with, and along our way, we uh, collected some of the un most unexpected supporters on our mission. And one of them is Audi, who is helping us to realize our dream. And they made a nice video about it, and I would like to show it to you. The moon, our closest neighbor in the solar system. And yet, it has always seemed distant and unreachable until now. Now, a private team of engineers is working to change that forever. They come from different backgrounds, countries, and fields of expertise. But what unites them is true pioneering spirit and the will to try the impossible. Who are these guys? They are the part-time scientists, and they are full-time crazy. Audi engineers are supporting them to build and test the Audi Lunar Quattro to make it ready for the moon's challenges in the context of the Google Lunar X Prize. Together, we will take collaboration and teamwork further and reach for the stars. Wherever this mission may take us, together we are following the true meaning of Horsprung Druck Technik. Join the part-time scientists on their mission, the mission to the moon. <laughs> this is our mission. This is what we have been working on tirelessly for the past six years. We want to send a rover to the moon, and we want to return to the moon to advance science. We want to inspire new generations of, student, of engineers, and we want to make space exploration affordable. This is our mission our mission to the moon, and you could be part of it. Thank you. <laughs>